compete in the cut-tightening top fuel dragsters. To race these nitro-burning monsters takes not only a great deal of skill, it takes money. Today, running against the nationally known superstars with big dollar backing is this 24-year-old kid from Miami. You know, breaking into the world of professional top fuel drag racing can be tough. Doing it without the benefit of a major sponsor gets tougher. Combine that with competing against the truly great legends in the sport, such as Don Garlitz or Shirley Madowney, can be a very humbling experience. But not for the new kid on the block. Hi, I'm Dave Bowman. Join me today as we visit the hidden heroes behind the fastest rising star in top fuel drag racing, the one known as the kid, Daryl Gwynn. Though it's tough to tell by looking at them, the Gwen team is a world away from the established stars. This is an all-volunteer crew, and they must race on their winnings. It's just their second season in professional top fuel racing, and the only two who work on the car full-time are Daryl and his fiancée, Shelly. Daryl grew up racing with his dad, Jerry, who is now the crew chief. And Jerry's old racing pal, Mike Cunningham, still works on the engines, but now shares the duty with his son, Chris. Daryl's high school buddies, Tony Mills, who's now a local fireman, and Dave Tomash help out on the weekends. And Chris has enlisted college friends Joe Schaefer and Andre Hayes to work on the team when they're not all in class or handling baggage together at night for Piedmont Airlines. As they prepare the car for Saturday's first qualifying run, the boys are relaxed and confident. At the last race, the Winter Nationals only one month earlier, they captured their first national event title when they defeated the famous top fuel veteran, Connie Coletta. The pride and elation of that victory gave them enough enthusiasm to keep them going the rest of the year. So last week, when the Gator Nationals were postponed due to a torrential Florida downpour, the crew remained undaunted. They knew they'd return today to pick up qualifying where they left off. As the crew works on the car, Jerry works out the combination of fuel system and drivetrain that will work with this weekend's drive at cool March weather by calculating all the various elements. The barometer, the temperature, the humidity, the air density, <clears throat> we have our own kind of type of formula for figuring this out. We calculate it all into one and in order to compensate for something like this, we, we change jets in the, in the fuel system. We, we change the blower overdrive, we change the percentage of nitro, we change the clutch around. Uh, there's, there's so many ways to, to tune these cars, that's why it's so easy to get away from your baseline because uh, one week they run really good and the next weekend they don't run too good and, and, and you change so many things during the course of a weekend it's so easy to become a champ one week and a chump the next. The biggest thing we tune this car around is the air and the clutch. That clutch doesn't know what it's hooked to. It's just spinning and it's forcing those levers to come out. It doesn't know what kind of motor it's hooked to. It don't know what it's hooked to. It just works off of RPM. And the car will run a lot of RPM today because of the air conditions. <clears throat> it's very dry today and it's cool outside. It's probably 45, 50 degrees when we go to run today at 11 o'clock. And those conditions, like I said, uh, our best times that we've made with this car would have been with air like this. But most of the Gwen team's competition has over 20 years of experience with the temperamental top fuel cars in air like this. Jerry Gwen's background is in alcohol fuel, and while they were the 1983 alcohol dragster world champions, it's not exactly the same as top fuel. In a way, Jerry is living out his dream. Oh, I would have always liked to have done it for a living. It's just, it was kind of a sideline. I had to, to worry about supporting him and his mother, and, and I couldn't just go out and race all the time. So I did the best I could with what I had. For years, I always said I would never do this because I couldn't afford to do it. And then he did so well becoming a world champion, too, that we said, well, the next step for you is, you know, is top fuel and, and a big corporate sponsor, maybe, and, and this kind of thing. So that's what we're hoping for. So far, Jerry's still racing only on weekends, but he's proud of the fact that he and his son are racing together. Do you ever worry about him when he's racing? Oh yeah, pretty regular. I, now I know what my mother went through for years. And that's why I'm viewing as the best one around. But, but I think he is. He's, he's one of the best, what we call levers. He's, he's the most consistent about leaving the starting line and paying attention to what goes on down through the race. He can tell us, yeah, the car shook a little bit or got a little loose or 
or whatever it might have done on the run so it can help us to tune the car up and make it run faster. He's probably one of the easiest drivers on a car because, you know, we have to, we have to fund it and uh, he knows if he goes out there and breaks a lot of stuff, then we're going to maybe not make the next race. This is a critical run, even though it's a checkout run and kind of a test run deal to see how much the air changes and if you compensate it for the air as much as it's changed. And if not, it's going to burn it up. As Darrell crosses the finish line, the engine burst into flame. The air has inflicted some major damage and the crew will have a lot of work to do. But the car ran a 5.58 seconds, moving them up to the fourth fastest qualifier, guaranteeing them a place on Sunday's race card. It burned up really quick right in the lights and I didn't have time to lift. It didn't really, uh, the tune-up just seemed to be off a little bit. Uh, it burned real, real quick. Like I said, I didn't have time to lift. I didn't know that it was burning up. Usually you have signs of it burning up when it lays down. Well, of course it didn't lay down too bad. It still run 240, 250 miles an hour. But uh, it's just one of them things. We tried something. Uh, we tried some different pistons in the motor this time, not a different compression or whatever. And we're hoping that doesn't have anything to do with it. We're going to dissect this thing a little bit before we go bolt another motor in there and go run. We don't want to do this again. At times like this, it's not the size of a man's salary that counts. It's how good he is at what he does. And the Gwen team is among the best. The father and the son, Mike and Chris Cunningham, they have been with us through our alcohol car. Mike helped me on my alcohol car and on my uh, Roadster in 1969 when I was a world champion. He's kind of an old timer like I am. He does the, the work on the, on the one side, on the left side of the head, and he's a, the one that finesses all of the extra, extra work that we do on the car. Racing with the Gwen team is special for Mike Cunningham because he works across the engine from his son. It gives me a lot of pride because Jerry puts a lot of confidence in him and the decisions that he makes on the clutch. A lot of fathers say they don't want their son to follow in their footsteps in their particular trade or something, but you come out here and you see how well he does and he's, and he's respected by a lot of other competitors. That's what really impresses you. That makes you feel good inside. It's enjoyable. We keep in close contact. Uh, I don't see him much at home because I'm either going to school or, or working and he's either sleeping or going to work. A lot of people are, are really impressed because there's two father-son teams on the same team and uh, they're really enjoyed by it. I'm impressed. I'm, I'm enjoyed to have him as my dad and you know, real proud for him. In building up the new engine, every part is carefully scrutinized and, if necessary, replaced or rebuilt. If you'll notice real closely, there's a ridge around the combustion chamber, a real slight ridge where the piston, when the rod broke, the piston came up and hit it. Now, if that would have been any conventional type of head, a, a cast type of head, aftermarket head, they would have more than likely had to replace that whole head because it just blew that whole combustion chamber apart. But BNZs are billet heads made by Ken Benny in Wadsworth, Ohio. The, the billet is so much stronger that all it did was just put a tiny little ridge in there and we'll take our little do more grinder and clean that up and they'll just be a-okay. To compete effectively with the best established teams in professional drag racing, you've got to have all the same tools and equipment they do. Jerry Gwynn has saved for years to build the team up to be competitive in top fuel. We started out years ago with a pickup truck and trailer and sell a pickup truck, sell a trailer, try and make money on it, uh, reinvest that money back into the company, build another trailer, maybe build two or three trailers, keep one and, and try and make it pay for the other one that you're going to keep. And, and then if, you know, the funds that we win from the alcohol cars throughout the years and everything is reinvested back into the company. And uh, then if we have a problem and then daddy has to reach in his back pocket and get the money and uh, hopefully that it'll pay back one of these days. So far, uh, we're not doing too well. One reason top fuel dragsters are so expensive is because the nitromethane fuel literally consumes parts. Like every top fuel team, the Gwen's trailer is filled with a number of spare components, both large and small. But under a large plastic cover sits their only remaining engine. At 4 p.m., they roll the car out to the starting line for the last round of qualifying. The Gwen team's goal on this last qualifying run is to find the right combination. The air is so good that the wily old swamp rat and world champion Don Garlitz has chosen not to fight it. He's resting on his number one qualifying position from last week. 
Everyone on the team wants this run to be perfect, but the bond between Jerry and Daryl is greater than the relationship between a crew chief and driver. Again, the car drops a cylinder and smokes a piston. This time, however, the rest of the field has improved their times, and the Gwen team falls back from fourth to eighth of 16 qualifying positions. In the pit, Jerry Gwynn is concerned about what they'll find when Joe Schaefer drops the oil pan. I work on the, it's called the bottom end. I'll take the oil pan off, uh, take the oil filter out, clean it up, take all the pistons out, check the main bearings for the crankshaft, do mainly the bottom end work. You got oil dripping down on you sometimes, and there's pistons will be hurt, you'll pop them out, and there'll be metal that's falling down on you, and that's real hot. But it's not too bad. It's okay if uh, if we're all in, working real good and everything's going real smooth, but if we're really in a, like this weekend, changing motors and switching this and everything's out of shape and we're not running real smooth, it's kind of different. But it's a good job. I like working down there. I kind of feel at home down there. It's kind of fun. No serious damage was done to the engine this time, but they'll replace the pistons anyway. What will they do differently to find the combination that can work with this air on race day? We put the different transmission ratio in, and it tugged on the motor a little too hard. So we're going to go back to our regular deal for tomorrow. They'll work as long as they have to in order to prepare for tomorrow's racing. We're just doing our normal every morning program, getting car ready, adjusting the valves, putting oil in it, checking the fuel system. And the next thing we'll do, we'll go completely over the car, get it all ready to go, make sure all the bolts are tight. There's nothing shaking loose from yesterday. Looking for cracks in the frame. Uh, they like to check the wing and everything, make sure it still looks good this morning. So just an overall quick glance at the car and give it a real good going over check for loose things that can hurt us on the first round or something like you get up there and you do a burnout and shake the tires and something falls off and that kills you for the day. Sunday morning is a relaxed atmosphere not only because the heavy work was all done last night but also because everyone pitches in and there are plenty of hands to help out. Well we have to have more people on the crew than a normal crew would have because we sometimes end up with not enough people there. Somebody couldn't get off. Uh, the schedule didn't allow them to get there. So we've kind of cross-trained everybody so that each one of them can do more than one job if, if need be. They all work for the airlines, so they fly to the races uh, the night before the race, and we race, and then we all rush to the airport to get home on Monday, and just Daryl and his girlfriend go to the next race and prepare the car for the following race. I think that's probably part of the, the reason that our team works so well because we've got two sons and two fathers and, and then uh, the, other, the other boys who work on the crew kind of relate to that and, and uh, it, it's a nice feeling to kind of have them all call you, you know, the, we're Jerry's kids and it, it's, it's pretty interesting. You can, you can look at some of these crews and the, the guys are not into what they're doing. They don't, I mean, we're into this. We have fun doing this. This is, this is you know, this is fun for us. This isn't a job. We just, we're here to have fun. That's the name of the game. You know, have fun, do the best we can, you know. There's a serious part of the, the operation, but then there's a time that we have to, you know, cut loose a little bit and play. Shuffling crew, shuffling down, going straight at you. By 10 a.m., the Gwen shuffling crew is busy warming up the car. From this, Jerry determines how to tune the engine, changing the fuel jets to give each cylinder just the right amount of fuel to balance with the air conditions, which can be their friend or their enemy. Ultimately, it's done through trial and error. We got the, we got the, uh, the difference between the two right. We just need, but we need, to, we need to lower the idle circuit. Today, they hope they guessed right. Well, we've changed the fuel mixture around. We've uh, increased the volume of fuel going to the motor, and hopefully it'll catch up with the air that we had so good yesterday. It's pretty close to the same. It's got just a little more, a little less humidity in it, so it'll be just a little bit better. 
problem we have here, the air is so good. And when we talk about air, everybody says, well, you know, it's 40 or 60 degrees, but it, it depends on altitude, and that's how much air or volume you can get into a cylinder. The colder it is, the more air you can compress into a cylinder. So you have to keep adding more and more fuel. Well, the air here is so good this weekend that we just can't, it don't seem like we can get enough fuel to all the cylinders evenly. That's the trick, is to get it to them evenly. So we always have to keep compensating to do that all the time. Like we keep increasing the fuel, keep putting more fuel to it, and it keeps taking it. But for some reason, number five just doesn't want to, doesn't seem to get enough. And it just keeps burning them. They're as ready as they can be, and at 11 a.m., they put it all on the line. Uh, we're a little bit more nervous than on Sunday mornings than we are on Fridays or Saturdays, you know. This first round is always the toughest. It'll, it'll be one of those little bugs that'll kill you that you didn't check, didn't catch. A loose line or a broken, something broke, you know. It's a psychological thing. Everybody is all keyed up and, you know, you go up there and something happens, you say, well, why didn't I catch it, you know? It's the same with any athlete. As soon as you get out there and you start playing, then the nervousness goes away. It's just a stand around and waiting what kills you. As the eighth fastest car, they're paired for the first round against Jimmy King from Rhode Island, the 16th qualifier. But they're racing more than the guy in the next lane. They're competing against the air as well. has engine trouble, gets loose and backs off as Darrell wins easily in 5.54 seconds at 251 miles an hour. The crew has mixed emotions, glad to advance to the next round, but concerned about the smoke from the engine. We've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, we got work. The Gwen team is already in the pit as the loudspeaker shouts out the famous names of top fuel drivers still on the track. The first round of competition isn't over, but our crew must assess their engine damage quickly and be ready to race again in 90 minutes. They find the number five piston shot and the crankshaft seriously damaged. Jerry faces a hard reality. I don't know, but we gotta go. Let's just do it. We've got no other choice. Yeah. All right, we've got to get the wheels on. Move the van. We've got to put the motor in it. It's their last engine. This is an expensive weekend for Jerry. Some of his competitors with big money behind them can afford to sacrifice an engine on every run if they don't get the right combination. But Jerry has always been conservative. Today, however, it's not a matter of choice. sounds fine and the burnout looks good but there's no way to predict what the engine will do under the load of a full run their elapsed time in the first round was better than half the field but eliminations mean only the best return now they face dick lahay a respected 25-year veteran of the sport Hay swerves and recovers, giving Gwyn the advantage. But Darrell's engine blows halfway down the track, and LaHay steams by for the win. Well, that's 
pretty depressing. You know, we were looking forward to going on and winning, trying to repeat what we did at the Winter Nationals, but can't let it get you down because you got another race to go to in a couple weeks. You've been on keyed up and go, go, go as fast as you can. You've seen what we've done here, you know. I mean, it's just not do a little bit and slow down and take a break. We go as fast as we can because there's so many jobs that has to be done. And finally, when you just when you lose, you hate to lose because you've worked so hard. We'll come back and we'll look the car over. We'll see what happened again. We'll tear it down right here before we go home, so we'll know what to do next week or when we get home. What we have, to, what changes we have to make for the next race. Well, we, we probably need a flow bench and that kind of stuff, but we can't afford that, so we'll just try and stay on top of the pump and stuff, and we'll go back and be a little more conservative. It may be a while before Jerry gets his flow bench, but that won't keep him from coming back and winning. For the hidden heroes of the all-volunteer Gwen Racing Team, I'm Dave Bowman.